Welcome everyone to GeoHug. Uh, so I'm Jess from Prospectors and CoreSafe and I'm your virtual host today. Uh, uh, but yes, welcome today for our special rock star is Roman Tesluk from Earth AI. So Roman started Earth AI because he saw a big opportunity to improve the way that we explore for metals. He's passionate about tackling the big issues through scientific research, then building the cutting edge technologies, bringing them to life and seeing the value that they generate. So I'm so excited that Roman's joined us today to tell us a bit about their story and to give us some insights into how to start an exploration tech startup. So thanks so much again, Roman. It's great to have you on today. Thanks so much, Jess. And it's awesome to, to hug you all. <laughs> um, starting uh, just the screen share. So I'm Roman, I'm founder of Earth AI, CEO and CTO. Uh, we are a vertically integrated uh, metals exploration company. We strive to build the, to be the most efficient at discovering, um, finding new sources of, of critical metals that like copper, lead, um, nickel, cobalt, rare earths, et cetera. These, the critical metals that can um, help the sustainable transition to, of the energy. Um, firstly, um, I want to start with what drives us. Um, what I think are the two of the most exciting jobs in the world is um, is being a inventor or being an explorer. Explorers they leave their their houses and venture somewhere unknown to the middle of nowhere in the search of new worlds and new discoveries. And inventors they experiment with new methods and techniques and try to find some new knowledge and create and engineer new discoveries in in a sense of uh, kind of helping the world build something new and i believe there is an inventor and an explorer each in every one of us um, and in this room like for the most of of this of this audience, it's actually our job. <laughs> um, so why do we explore? Why do we need metals um, at all? Um, we need metals because they build. We build from metals. We build all the uh, everything we we drive or. Live and we build the iPhones, build the cars, the infrastructure. Um, and right now, the biggest problem we have is the actual um, the the source of our energy that we use. It's it's uses a lot of fo fossil fuels. It contaminates the environment. And we want to make the transition to the sustainable energy. And to do that, it's it's actually requires huge amounts of of new infrastructure to be built. And we don't actually have enough metals produced right now to build all that infrastructure. And um, if you look at the current reserves, um, we, we only have maybe to cover the next two decades, but if we really want to be sustainable and, um, and have a clean environment, clean world, um, a lot of new discoveries need to be found. Right now, the there's a the, the kind of the, the trend of the last few decades is that the quality of new discoveries is is declining, and numbers of new discoveries are is 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 declining. And firstly, that is happening because over everything really obvious has been found, and finding new deposits it's just like a tremendously hard scientific problem. Um, Founding Earth AI, it is sort of, I thought about helping the world with this, with this problem. And our mission is, is actually finding new sources of critical metals to help the sustainable transition. Um, so to sum up, like, what do you need to start an exploration tech startup? Well, first you gotta love what you do. Remember that spirit of exploration and invention, and you must just kind of love what you do. Two is you need to know it has a purpose. You're either helping someone or you're helping the world and everyone 
uh, with what you're doing. And three is being ready to persevere and be patient. These, um, these things take years, if not decades, to, um, to, to, to kind of to get done. So it, you need to be patient and need to be, you know, have that perseverance um, to get it done. So it's, it's, it's a big, it's a big, it's a long haul. <laughs> Um, I'll tell you a little bit about, about our story, my story. So I'm, I'm Ukrainian, um, I've, I'm a geologist, studied in, in Ukraine, uh, worked a little bit in exploration in the Far East and, and north of Russia, mostly looking for precious metals. Um, and um, then I, I went there because I was excited about the frontiers and like the tundra and the beautiful mountains. Um, but then I also wanted to do, to kind of create new methods of exploration. So I, that's how I got to Sydney in 2015 um, to start a PhD in the University of Sydney. It was focused on geochemistry and tectonics. And um, while doing it, I saw this big opportunity slash problem. Um, there is like, when you're when you're researching you can collect your own new data but that's what everybody does um, and it's less compelling to go and kind of go through archives of others and compile it all into this one global database so there are piles and piles of this you know hundreds of millions of archive data points you're not in perfect condition um, stored in different places but there's so much knowledge in all this data that that you can learn from, and uh, if if one can combine all of that, then then you could you could derive some great insights. Um, I tried to pitch this as going to change my topic of research, but I couldn't, so I actually um, decided to drop out and start that AI, and that's that's sort of mm, that's what I did. Um, moving on from just Kind of geochemistry we started working with remote sensing data and combining these two sources of data plus additional uh, other other types to create this target generator uh, system using ai i guess what i didn't mention is there is a lot of data you can't just go through it um, manually you have to like we're talking about you know 400 million data points for a current database. You need an automated way to kind of go through the data and learn from it. And um, we started work, working on this technology that was probably early, early 2017. Um, and so we started working on solving this problem, experimenting, trying to find a way to build this target generator system. Uh, once we starting to get this early success, um, we um, wanted to test it out and we needed some users. We thought the easiest way of entry would be to build a software as a service company. Um, so um, the interesting story is that I got a, um, went online, got a list of SX companies alphabetically and started cold calling everyone and offering our help and our services. And um, we started with a trial that converts into a paid subscription. So we had quite a lot of, probably like first 15 trials were all companies starting from A. <laughs> and then we had a lot of Bs. It probably stopped at, at some, somewhere around the middle of the, of the alphabet. Um, so um, the trials are going great. Actually, we, we started we started having some customers. Um, we were learning so much with the technology. We went from like little state databases to like continental database and eventually moving to kind of multiple continents. Um, the quality of predictions started to become better. Um, by the end of 2017, we raised our first seed round and we've done 80, 80 trials with ASEC listed um, explorers and miners. And we wanted to move faster. We wanted to, to go and, and make discoveries are there, are there, are there for, our, for our clients to make discoveries or ourselves? And I felt like, you know, we're not moving fast enough. And, you know, maybe I was a little impatient, but we, that's whatever happened. Um, we 
so we we actually were thinking about the business model and obviously as a new business and new technology and that's a common problem that a lot of ai star startups have is how to how to bring this value and, and change something um how to how to do that so we actually changed um our model to doing exploration ourselves uh, stop doing the, ser the, the services, move to scan the whole state of Northern Territory, um, generated a lot of predictions, um, started building our in-house operations, which are which are super proud of right now, um, hired geologist teams, started testing our targets. And, you know, the campaign turned out to be extremely successful because we went to completely greenfield areas super exciting the rocks have never seen before free like vacant land that not like nobody has a license on no historical exploration uh, we tested 135 sites and 35 of them were mineralized and that that proved a 26 percent success uh, chance in success rate in this greenfield setting which is which is revolutionary um so once we so we 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 got this pretty quickly maybe in, in like in within six months of like two teams exploring just so quickly and probably spend like two hundred fifty thousand on this whole this whole campaign which is super uh, capital efficient. Um, we so we got there. We decided what we're going to actually do. Who we want to be at this stage. And decision we took was to not stop here and take it mineral exploration as the whole and think about how to completely revolutionize it how to how to help it help it how to what are the key issues and and on one end is is like the quality of the of the land you're exploring and we wanted to bring some brand new sites that that are that are that have high potential and um, and while moving through this kind of discovery process of understanding, doing more mapping, doing more surveying, um, we eventually, you know, you end up to the point where you need to drill and get three-dimensional data. And the cost of drilling is really high. And that is actually defining the, a lot of it is defining the quality of the success of, of, the, um, of the campaign. Because you don't, don't, you don't, you rarely have this unlimited budget. Um, in the real world, so you, you know the, the the lower your cost, the more you can do. Therefore, the the higher your chances of success. So we decided to to tackle that. Sorry, that was the, the slide for the greenfield success and in-house operations. So that is one of our gossens that we found with with base metals, and that's our magnetic drone, which is kind of outside the topic of this situation to quickly gather this the survey data uh, sorry moving on to the low-cost drilling so um <laughs> this is me helping out in the research um so um we realized that we we we, we went a little bit bold in in that drilling because we actually built our own drill rig at the beginning and then we then we realized understood completely how it's built and and engineered, but at the end, we actually re understood that there, there are two other issues in the drilling that is the, um, th that are the defining things right now. That probably the number one priority is before we re-engineer the drill is the the ground disturbance and the mobility. Um, we've done a lot of hardware engineering things then. It probably took us two years to get the complete system done. And um, as a result, right now we're 50% um, uh, cheaper to drill in-house compared to contractors. How do we achieve that? Is we have like a zero disturbance mud system. It's all about ground and poor circulation at a affordable cost, and also high mobility. So all of our equipment is is um, either on so on highly mobile platforms, so we can move drill sites in a few hours and we can move camps in three two three trips and that actually when you think about exploration and drilling um drilling is 
obviously, you know, to get good rates, normally you have to have the scale of the campaign. But when, when I think about drilling, it's, it's more of a kind of a way to get three dimensional data. And when you drill, like when you get the core, you need that lag time to think. So, so we actually kind of making this with this higher mobility and low disturbance where we don't like require any groundworks. We are unlocking this way of being more nimble and, and acquiring different, um, different points in different locations kind of much faster um, while keeping the cost low. Um, another thing that we, that we realized is that um, it is much more efficient when you take an expert looking at exploration as a whole, you have, you want to like, develop this funnel model um, where we start with a large amount of early stage targets. And then we gradually learn about them and mature the portfolio um, to kind of end up at smaller and smaller number of projects and eventually getting to drill and getting to drilling for economic assessment and ending up with, with one project with um, world-class potential. And um, our, our, um, our plan is super exciting right now is we want to um, we were like, over the last four years, we were um, going, um, we were like building these stages one by one. So there was, you know, we first done the AI, then we've done the geology, then geophysics, then drilling. And, and now we actually started this New South Wales campaign where we run the full funnel from top to bottom um, without, you know, just all together. And uh, that's great, you know, this, this year has been uh, not an easy year for anyone, but uh, this is super exciting that everything is coming back to life and we are able to do this. Um, what also exciting is, I guess, as I said, it, things take a long time, um, but you gotta think about the ultimate big picture and uh, the future and what is, drives us is, you know, the prospect of, something further away, um, exploring the other planets, that would be super cool. I think it's just like, we can dream about this and this could be our vision. And it's, um, and you know, we, we kind of align our technologies to be able to use them later, but I think it's just gonna be so exciting in the future. Um, I like to talk about that. I think it's really cool. Um, lastly, I wanted to thank, our team, it's um, it's a like the adventures we go through. You would never survive alone, and and um, so so I really thank our team uh, for all they've done. This is not the full team, by the way, because geographical restrictions we have right now. But um, just want to say, I love my team. Um, without you, I can't survive. With you, we can survive any crisis. Um, thanks so much. That's that's it for today. Thanks so much for sharing with us. Uh, did anyone have any questions? Got a awesome talk, very interested to hear more about the startup. Um, how do you account for false negatives? Example, incorrect geological interpretations, models and poor sampling. Yeah, so um, we have, well, so, um, there, there are two questions there. One is like AI startups, there, there's actually probably half and half is work. One is you work on the technology, the other half you work on the data that you fit in. So we have a, a super heavy data cleanup technology, which is like half automated with a lot of like human reviews and different stages, but also a lot of automated cleaning. So we really kind of like hand pick the data we use at a like multi-million scale. Uh, that's sort of one. Two for more like a false negatives. Uh, I guess maybe like a there's a three, but so the, the first two is the, when you are making the predictions of, for, for where do you go, like we run the cross-validation and all the traditional machine learning techniques to um, 
precision recall to kind of quantify um, the kind of distinguish between the predictions, which one is better, which one is worse. And we try to look for clusters that are kind of um, spatially coherent. Um, and obviously we would prefer a high precision cluster over a high recall cluster. Um, but you know, eventually when you run out of high precision clusters, we go for high recall. Um, and the thirdly is the actual kind of on the ground success rate. And for us, for us really, I think when you bring cost into the equation and you're okay, strategically okay to have, um, to have the kind of, to test a lot. Cause I feel like, you know, if you're going with a portfolio, you have to test a lot. You have to test hundreds of targets. Um, in, in that case, you know, we actually think like overall that that campaign we've done before, it was a $10,000 cost per prospect discovery with significant surface uh, geochemical anomalies. Uh, I think that's that's a pretty affordable price to just go with 26%. I think it's actually quite great. Excellent. Um, are you doing brownfield exploration as well or is it just greenfield? Am I doing Yes, yes, we do. Um, like in this new campaign, we actually have a few projects that um, have had some previous work done on. But for us, you know, we still want to make sure we have the value to add. And, and in in our sense, it's it's the better analysis of kind of predicting. So if you have a, a the, the major project you have, we want to when we get in, we want to know um, find some extensions, try to predict where it goes, try to generate some new knowledge. Um, and there's some other technologies that, that we build like Gasket to understand the deposit itself. Um, also, I guess, obviously, the lower cost of drilling means we could drill more holes to have more chances to explore the brownfield. So yes, like right now, we do have a few green brownfield projects as well in the, in the portfolio. Excellent. Um, did anyone else have any questions? You're welcome to jump off mute now as well. We can just have a bit of a chat, um, have some discussions. Anyone? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, Michael. Yep. Um, I I dropped out. I mean, I was dropped out, uh, so I missed, unfortunately, missed some of the start. How um, can we have some clarification on the twenty six percent success rate? How was that measured? What constituted a success? Yeah, so in that sense, we are the, the model is built to predict um, geochemical anomalies above uh, 500 ppm. It depends on the model. So if we're going and we're finding a prospect that has about 500 ppm uh, copper, for example, we are training for 500 ppm copper. We get that in the soil or, in the, or a rock in a consistent matter over a consistent area of like maybe two, three hundred meters strike was you know good enough with um, we call that a, a successful target validation and the the number is just by target tested divided by targets validated and and i apologize again that i missed probably what i'm about to ask but the that was in the northern territory yes and and you took no account of the geology, you just sort of did it blind, or how did you select the areas? Yeah, so this is just blind. So that as you, you missed the, the funnel, but so the the first stage is this sort of greenfield targeting. That is what we do first. We just go from our predictions to the available land. Obviously, go through the compliance where we can actually access and explore further, and we are just going and testing our targets. It takes uh, probably half a day to access, and we do like a a soil grid pattern, trying to identify either, either um, you know, high geochemistry or some, or related mineralogy, and uh, so we do like one to two targets a day, and just, yeah, that's how it works. And then, then we have this sort of stage two where we, where we come back and we kind of map around the area, try to form hypotheses of, um, kind of what could be causing this this thing, where it's the, where the or what it could be and. That's a full kind of like two week, two, three week trip after that, after we have something already there. 
And maybe to that, it's like a, it's a very kind of precise targeting. So it's like the targets we have, they're like in the vicinity of like 500 by 500 meters on average. So we go kind of straight to it. We go, we do the testing. We send the samples to the lab. If they come successful, then we come back and do the mapping. If they don't come successful, we found nothing. We just move on. Heaps of great ones coming through on the chat. Uh, so is your exploration funded by industry partners? If not, what can you do with your findings? Um, so we are, a, um, maybe that's something I didn't touch on too much, but we are a um, venture backed technology company. Um, our business model exploration, but uh, our funding comes from venture capital. Um, right now it's mostly Silicon Valley as we move the headquarters uh, to San Francisco. Um, and the second part is uh, what can we do with our projects? Um, so we're focusing on the early stage of exploration when we, when we, when like our projects matured, like matured to the point where um, it comes to kind of resource definition and feasibility. That's when we want to um, divest them into, into some partners who want to develop them further. Okay. Um, what sort of data do you use and where are they sourced from example in New South Wales? Um, we use various sorts of data. So um, they're sourced from kind of government surveys, um, national archives. We kind of have a global database that we use to target everywhere. So um, there's geochemistry, there's surface occurrences, there's um, um, astro data you know, from, from NASA. Um, there is the geophysics, regional kind of gravity magnetics, radiometry, um, some drilling data, like pretty typical geological data. I mean, like we also started using this um, new system where we go through papers and extract some of the kind of relationship data. And then it's, it's like a graphical neural network. So I don't want to go too deep, but that's like to help you understand understand the project by learning on other other deposits, which have been explored. That's cool. Uh, so, what does interplanetary exploration look like for you and Earth AI? How do you envision envision in my gosh envision it coming to fruition? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there is data in like there is there is remote sense data on the moon. We could generate targets tomorrow, but we can't validate them. Um, we were always so, so we are working on drilling automation, like we have the, so we have the AI targeting to, to predict where to go. That's easy. Then the, the next, next bit we don't have, then the drilling, we're working on automation, we feel it could be automated. We don't know exactly the, the, the type of drilling we could do. I mean, it's the diamond, you have to kind of vacuum seal everything pretty well. Could be done, I'm not sure. Um, but in the middle, we always wanted to build this, this rover, which we will at some point do rover to come and grab samples and do like almost like a NASA rover, but like here to drive around, take some samples, do some XRF measurements. That'd be great. Um, I think, you know, if we combine these three, the, the predict, the targeting prediction, the rover that can go and map around and scan and collect some geochemical data on the surface and a, and an automated drill rig that can drill uh, drill and then maybe scan the core. Uh, that could be done. Um, for the development to mining, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. I've, I have a few friends that are building autonomous mining startups that um, maybe they can help with that. I haven't seen anything else come through at this point. So I just want to thank you so much for coming on this week and chatting with us. Um, it was great to see so many different different questions coming through and some familiar faces again this week. So thanks everyone for getting involved. Um, yes, thank you so much again for joining and um, yeah, I hope you had fun. <laughs>